This video is about urban soils, which I'm using to describe soils that are in areas where they've been affected by human activities related to construction and building. One of the functions of a soil is that it can be used as an engineering medium, meaning that it can be compacted so that it can support roads, homes, and so on. To achieve this, generally the topsoil is removed because it has too much organic matter, and that's unstable when you want a good foundation for a building. The remaining soil is then compacted to make sure that it doesn't continue to shift, and there's going to be physical barriers that are placed everywhere. That can be a horizontal barrier like pavement, that can be vertical barriers from retaining walls and foundations and so on. And all of these things affect plant growth because they create conditions that are not good for roots. The chemistry of the soil can also be changed because of the building materials that are used and the soil can be contaminated if the contractors are careless. In a truly urban environment, like in the city, it's even harder to get a compromise between what the trees need for proper growth and what's needed to support all the buildings. Underground, you have conflicts with utilities, underground parking or structures like basements. Above ground, you have issues like visibility of signs and buildings, building clearance, and street or sidewalk clearance. The number one predictor of how well it's going to do is how much soil it has. The more soil it has, the more likely it is to get to full size, but that also means that there's less pavement, there's less support for loads that are going to be moving through that area. Some trees are really resilient anyway, and they can bust through that cut out and grow as much as they want. But a tree that's successful in those conditions is also one that's causing a lot of infrastructure damage. So usually it ends up getting removed anyway. There have been engineering solutions to reach a compromise between the plant needs and the building needs. These include structural soils, structural cells, and suspended pavement. Starting with the structural soils, these are soils that are made of mostly rock with a little bit of soil and perhaps some other mix-ins to help bind the soil to the rock. The goal is to have a soil that can both bear load but also have enough space for water and air for the roots. Cornell University was one of the early pioneers. They developed what they called the Cornell University Structural Soil or CU Soil. It is made up of about 80% stone, about 20% soil, usually a clay loam. They also put hydrogel in there, which helps to increase the water holding capacity, but also help the soil stick to the surface of the rock so it doesn't just settle out of the mix. The way this works is that the rock is angular and so it doesn't compact together fully. In between the rocks are voids and that's where the soil hangs around so the soil itself doesn't get compacted. And the roots can also grow through these voids and there will be air in them as well. There are a few important caveats. You also need good drainage and the trees must be irrigated because there's not a lot of soil in the mix. If the irrigation system fails, the trees will die. The next option is suspended sidewalk or pavement. You have a series of vertical posts or columns with horizontal beams and this structure supports a deck above it. Since it's the structure that's doing the support, not the soil, you can use any kind of soil with suspended pavement. The soil is filled in around those columns or posts, and that's what the tree roots grow into. If you can imagine, this has to be specifically engineered to support the amount of weight that's going to be above it, so it can be a big engineering problem. Structural cells are another product that's related to suspended pavement. Instead of engineering a deck, you can use this modular system to support the pavement. So the structural cell includes a modular frame that is open on all sides. Because the frame supports the load and transfers that load to the soil beneath, 
the soil inside the cells can also be uncompacted. An air gap is left between the soil and the deck above it so that the roots can't lift the pavement as they continue to grow. Irrigation can also be placed in this section. To be successful, the opening for the tree trunk has to be as large as possible. If there isn't enough space for the trunk flare, the tree will eventually push up on the pavement anyway. If you've heard of silva cells, that's a brand of structural cells. The Deep Root website has a lot of examples of how silva cells are used. They also include examples of their use with existing trees. Most of the work then is excavating the soil from around the roots, pruning out roots selectively, and installing the cells within the root system. So you can imagine it's very labor intensive to do that. With the structural cells, utilities and other underground infrastructure can be placed inside the cells and the remaining space will be available for root growth. These are definitely very expensive alternatives to giving the trees enough soil to grow in, but sometimes you have to compromise in urban environments. Some cities, especially wealthy ones, may require the use of these alternatives. I've also seen structural cells be used to keep stormwater on site.